Well, hello once again. Welcome back to Classic Dirt Bike TV. And as we head towards the end of 2022, a big thanks to each and every one of you out there who have uh, taken the time to take a look at my video content uh, during uh, this year. And also uh, a big thanks to the subscribers who signed up to my uh, video channel. And hope you will all stay with me uh, for next year when we uh, will continue to showcase many of these uh, long lost uh, forgotten uh, vintage dirt bikes. But we still have one more video for you to take a look at before the end of the year, and uh, this time round we're going to take a look at a bike that uh, very few people uh, knew about uh, during the 1980s and this uh, featured machine was a fully British uh, built bike so we're going to take a look at that now and uh, let's uh, dive right into the video and take a look at this 1980 uh, Wilco Moto 500. Now I suspect that if like me you've probably uh, never even heard of the name Wilco Moto and in fact uh, up until I actually came across this featured bike myself I also had never even heard of the name let alone the actual uh, motorcycle and I still uh, remember to this day when the bike's owner uh, approached me and said uh, I've got a nice uh, Wilco Moto here in my collection if you're interested in doing a bike uh, feature but naturally I just turned to him and replied, a what? But uh, ever since that first day, I've been really intrigued with this bike and the story behind the Wilcomoto uh, company. But this uh, fantastic and super rare uh, motocrosser uh, was all designed and built and sold by just the one uh, family, the Wilcox family from Herefordshire in the southwest of the UK. Now the Wilcox family were very well known in the local area and uh, Tom and his three sons uh, Steve, Brian and Michael uh, were all into uh, motorcycles in a big way and they attended uh, many local uh, scrambles events and were forever uh, doing repairs, uh, upgrades and other engineering work on their own and other people's uh, race bikes and to say the least uh, these guys were very highly skilled at what they did. Now, eventually, uh, the Wilcox boys decided to just go ahead and uh, build their very own motocross race bike. But uh, rather than doing things uh, the easy way by uh, using already tried and tested frames, engines and other components that you could just pick up from your local bike shop, uh, the Wilcox boys uh, were going to design, build and even manufacture all of the components of their brand new machine so it would be a fully uh, British built bike with British parts and essentially uh, this was going to be uh, one of the first uh, fully British built motocrossers to take to the track since those great days of Alan Clues and CCM. And uh, when you uh, take a look at some of the sales promotions and the brochures that were promoting uh, their brand new bike, it certainly looked at the part uh, back in the day because uh, this new British built bike was just jam packed with innovative engineering and exotic uh, construction uh, materials. But uh, when you look back at some of these sales brochures, of these bikes in their day. Uh, they had put the price of these uh, Wilco Motos between £1,600 and £1,800. So even for 1980, uh, these Wilco Motos were certainly uh, not cheap. But having said that, it appeared that you were going to get uh, quite a good lot of bike for your money. And judging by these uh, glossy ads of the bike's uh, specifications, they all looked uh, pretty good uh, on paper. Although with regards as to how many of these Wilco Motos were actually made is another uh, bit of a mystery because some uh, say that it was about 50 while others will tell you that uh, it was nearer 150 and it seems that each time you ask someone in the know then they all come up with a completely uh, different figure. But one thing is absolutely certain and that is that these 
are without doubt its super rare machines and uh, our beautiful example here has just recently undergone a full uh, restoration. Now this set of pictures here are of an enduro version of the Wilco Moto 500 and this bike is uh, currently uh, awaiting restoration but it's essentially uh, exactly how our featured bike looked uh, prior to its refurbishment. So uh, our current owner not only has uh, just one of these extremely rare bikes in his possession that he also has uh, the second machine just uh, waiting its turn to be brought back to life uh, once again and uh, in this clip here you can just get an idea of the task involved to restore uh, one of these rare uh, Wilco motos and who knows we may even return to this bike to feature it on classic uh, dirt bike TV at a later date So let's just uh, crack on with our featured uh, machine, which is another bike uh, taken from the Terry Pickering collection. And as in uh, many of Terry's other bikes in his motorcycle collection, this Wilkomoto is uh, another bike that's uh, been given the full-on restoration treatment by Keith Ree. So beginning with the bike's frame, which uh, was designed, shaped and welded, by the Wilcox family before then being uh, painted in this uh, black uh, colour. Now Reynolds 531 steel tubing was used and uh, this was uh, both strong and durable enough uh, to take uh, the punishment when this bike was racing in that uh, extremely tough 500 uh, motocross class. And even just looking at this frame you can see that it's been uh, very well uh, put together, but of course it would have to be uh, to cope with those uh, very quick horses uh, waiting to be let loose from that uh, Wilcox engine. Okay, so uh, next up it's uh, this big 500cc uh, Wilcomoto two-stroke engine, which uh, once again was designed and built by the Wilcox boys. Now, uh, to manufacture the motor's magnesium casings, uh, Wilcox uh, gave the blueprints of the casings uh, to a local foundry who then uh, made up the rough castings and then returned the raw parts uh, back to the Wilcomoto company who then uh, did all of the machining and finishing to enable them uh, to take all of the other internal engine components which were uh, once again all made by uh, Wilcomoto. So essentially the engine is a single cylinder air-cooled 500cc two-stroke that uh, as I remember I think it had a bore of 87 millimeters and an engine stroke of 83 uh, millimeters. Now this aperture or hole in the cylinder's barrel uh, was said uh, to be machined into the barrel as uh, Wilcomoto's future plans for this engine uh, was to add a power valve at a, a later stage on uh, some of the future models. Although as far as I know, uh, this uh, upgrade uh, never actually uh, took place. But it certainly makes the barrel look uh, quite weird when you see it uh, on the bike. Now to feed that big thirsty 500 motor we have a 41 millimeter Delorto uh, PHM carburetor which uh, actually is just one of the very few parts that the Wilcox team uh, didn't manufacture for this bike but uh, the biggest percentage of all of the parts that went into building uh, this machine were all made in-house at their uh, Herefordshire uh, premises. Now the fuel air mixture was fed through a 16 petal uh, reed valve block and uh, the air filter uh, was also a fully washable foam item that was accessed uh, from underneath the bike seat just like many of the other motocrossers uh, of their day and the air filter's air box uh, was naturally uh, made of plastic as uh, more or less all of the other off-road bikes of that period had uh, these kind of uh, plastic items in their air filter box uh, construction. 
Now, to provide the sparks for our Wilcomoto, the uh, Wilcox engineers decided uh, just to use a Motoplat electronic ignition system because uh, as talented as these guys were, uh, this Motoplat unit was still a much better option than uh, starting from scratch and then designing their own ignition unit. But uh, these Motoplat ignition systems uh, were already quite well proven having been used on the old Michaels for many years so in that respect uh, this part of the engine was uh, just a no-brainer in terms of the bike's ignition system. And on the motor's transmission side the engine was fitted with a constant mesh four-speed gearbox which again it was all machined by the Wilcox bike builders, as were all of the clutch and other internals inside uh, this motor. Now, the wet multi-plate clutch was connected to the crankshaft by a primary gear drive, which was uh, more durable and more reliable than maybe using a primary chain, just like the old uh, Michaels of the past. And uh, when these... Uh, Wilco Motors were launched back in 1980. Many uh, commented that these 500 engines uh, looked like copies from the hugely successful uh, Yamaha YZ490 of that same period, which is uh, totally untrue, of course, because uh, the Yamaha's uh, primary drive is uh, on the opposite side to our uh, Wilcox 500. But with this engine having been made with magnesium casings, uh, naturally, it kept uh, the overall weight of the engine to a decent level. And if you believe uh, all of the brochures of that day, uh, these 500 two-stroke engines were said to pump out around the 58 horsepower mark, which was pretty awesome for a relative uh, newcomer to motocross bike uh, manufacturing. And as you can see, it was uh, quite a formidable lump for a 500 single uh, two-stroker. Now again, as far as I'm aware, uh, the motor's exhaust expansion chamber was uh, all manufactured at Wilcox HQ, whose uh, address at that time uh, was given out as uh, the old saw mills in Home Lacey in uh, Hereford. But uh, it was quite amazing really just how many parts that Wilcox actually made for this bike. And uh, on the face of it, it appeared that uh, there was absolutely nothing that they couldn't uh, manufacture. But then again, with all of the great engineering skills that's gone into designing and manufacturing all of the uh, intricate parts on this bike, then you'd think that such a simple thing like an exhaust and tailpipe would just be child's play for the Wilcox family. So as we move on to the uh, Wilcomoto's uh, front end, we have more exotic lightweight magnesium here in the top and bottom uh, fort yokes or triple clamps. And these magnesium parts were uh, also cast by the local foundry, whereby uh, Wilcox then uh, did all of the machining and finishing before then uh, fitting the forks back uh, onto the bike. Now, the fork stanchions were just hydraulic telescopic air-assisted uh, 42 millimeter units uh, with the stanchions uh, being chrome plated and uh, the fork bottoms uh, were once more cast in weight saving uh, magnesium. But to be fair, these forks were pretty basic in their design and in terms uh, of their tuning or adjustments, uh, this was uh, kind of limited to adding or removing air to either harden or soften uh, their action. But I expect that if you experimented with some softer or harder springs or maybe even different weights of oil, then you could certainly improve uh, their performance. But they did offer the rider about 330 millimeters of suspension uh, movement, which was, uh, I think it was just short of the 13 inches mark. Although uh, to be fair to the Wilcox engineers, uh, this was still the early 1980s, and this uh, was the suspension technologies uh, of their day. 
Although uh, another Wilcox innovation uh, was engineered on this front wheel hub and disc, now uh, rather than having the brake disc bolted onto the hub in the conventional manner, Wilcox uh, then cast the hub and its disc as one part, which uh, for its day was quite radical on a motocross uh, race bike, although uh, maybe chrome plating uh, the disc was uh, maybe not such a great idea as it did uh, compromise the friction effect when you were trying to stop uh, the bike. But the diameter of the disc was around the 260 millimeter mark, which was uh, quite substantial for 1980, although uh, to be fair again, it was a big 500, so it did take a bit uh, of uh, slowing down. But uh, once again, uh, more Wilcox engineering on this front brake caliper, which was uh, just a simple uh, single piston uh, caliper and uh, once more made from that expensive uh, magnesium. But with the disc uh, being chrome plated and uh, just a single pot caliper here on the front, I suspect that this uh, front brake setup uh, wouldn't have been uh, very powerful. Surprisingly though, uh, both the front and the rear wheels on our Wilcomoto 500 uh, were uh, 21 inch items and not the usual uh, 21 inch front wheel and 18 inch uh, rears that you normally find on other off-road bikes of the 1980s. But these uh, Akront alloy rims were very good quality and uh, that gold colouring uh, fits in uh, quite nicely with the orange and uh, yellow uh, theme of the bike. Now the bike's uh, very nicely engineered rear swing arm is an aluminium part and not steel, which was uh, probably chosen uh, to keep the uh, all-up weight of the bike down and continue the theme of keeping all of the associated parts on the machine as light and as strong as possible and also complement uh, all those other light magnesium components already bolted uh, on to the bike. But again, this alloy swing arm is quite long, probably engineered just to get the weight distribution and overall uh, geometry of the bike uh, correct. So when it came to the bike's rear suspension, uh, Wilcomoto opted to use a single monoshock unit on the rear with uh, no rising rate linkages uh, to connect it to the chassis and swing arm. It was just a simple uh, bolt on either end of the shock uh, to connect it to the swing arm and the chassis. But once again, this was another designed and built uh, Wilcox unit that uh, had a separate shock and gas reservoir that uh, Wilcox called their total uh, recirculatory uh, system. And uh, rather than having the gas and oil reservoir mounted uh, piggyback style, uh, Wilcox moved the unit away from the shock and placed it on this left hand side of the swing arm where it could be better cooled and therefore uh, try and keep that big shock uh, working well uh, when the going got tough. Now I'm not sure how much uh, gas and oil that this unit uh, actually contained, but uh, as you can see it was almost as big as the shock itself. Although uh, at the time I grabbed these pictures, I think uh, this uh, unit was probably in need of being uh, re-gassed because uh, you can see in this picture here that the bike's uh, sitting uh, quite low at the back end when in actual fact it, uh, fact it should be probably uh, sitting up several inches taller than you see here. But in 1980 uh, motocross terms, uh, this rear suspension setup was certainly very unique and unlike anything that anybody had uh, seen before. Again, the Wilco's uh, fuel tank is a plastic unit 
and uh, initially all of the plastics that surrounded uh, this bike were all manufactured by a local company uh, to the Hereford area but uh, it's also said that sometime later uh, the Wilcox family again uh, manufactured these parts themselves but uh, this fuel cell here is said to have held about uh, 14 litres of pre-mixed gas which was uh, just about enough to feed that uh, big Thirsty 500 uh, Wilco engine uh, with its fuel. But as you'd expect, uh, original uh, tank decals for a 1980 Wilcomoto 500 are uh, rarer than hen's teeth to try and locate and uh, these replacement graphics here are almost certainly uh, reproduction stickers but uh, they're still uh, historically accurate to the Wilcox originals. Now the bike's side panels once again were all part of the bodywork that was supplied by the local uh, plastics company and to fit them onto the chassis it was just a simple uh, pair of uh, flat screws that held them in place but they certainly added uh, to the style and the sleek lines of this uh, very rare bike. Now the big 500 had certainly one of the plushest seats in motocross in 1980 and it had uh, just the right combination of firmness and suppleness uh, to help protect those uh, crown jewels if you came down hard on the seat after uh, a big jump but uh, once again uh, manufacturing a seat for a motocross bike uh, wasn't such a big deal for the Wilcox uh, family when you consider that some of the other engineering tasks that they've had to overcome uh, to put this bike uh, together but overall the bike still had uh, the look of something that was very comfortable uh, to ride. Now up at the business end of our uh, Wilcomoto the handlebars are another uh, component that was built at the old Sommel premises in Hereford. Uh, no fancy rentals on this puppy of course, these bars are uh, custom made for this bike uh, with that racing crossbar uh, welded on and not uh, bolted as many of our modern bikes are uh, these days. And this uh, front brake master cylinder is another uh, Wilcox uh, made product uh, specifically uh, manufactured for our Wilco 500 but uh, this part again was more than likely uh, forged uh, by an outside source and then uh, the Wilcox uh, company uh, performed all of the machining before it was then uh, fitted uh, onto the bike. But uh, that throttle gasser though is uh, not a Wilco uh, part but uh, this is a Magura uh, twist grip and uh, this part has the job of taming uh, the grunt from that big powerful 500cc uh, two-stroke motor and uh, with a reputed 58 horsepower on tap you'd have to be uh, certainly on the ball when you snap this uh, speed uh, controller wide open. And the bike's uh, levers are uh, alloy Magura items which uh, are quite common parts and uh, were readily available uh, during the 1980s and uh, all of the other control cables and even the hydraulic front brake hose are all supplied uh, by Venhill uh, cables. And once more the bike's uh, rear hub as far as I'm aware was an alloy uh, cast part which was uh, also uh, forged by a local uh, foundry and then uh, the raw castings once more returned to the Wilcox engineers to then do all of the machining to enable them to fit uh, bearings and other parts uh, for the brakes. Now the rear brake on our 500 uh, Wilcomoto was an old school drum brake system and not a hydraulic unit like the front and as you can see quite a substantial rear drive sprocket on our featured bike although uh, the size of this 
uh, rear drive sprocket is probably uh, determined uh, by the gearing of the motor's four-speed uh, gearbox. But in terms of the brakes uh, stopping power, it was uh, exactly what you'd expect uh, from a 1980 uh, motorcycle uh, drum brake. But again, more excellent engineering on this rear brake torque rod and uh, this chain guide this time, uh, all manufactured in alloy just to try and help save a bit of uh, weight. But uh, once more, all of these parts uh, looking factory fresh once again after the bike's recent uh, restoration by Keith Ree. But in the early days of the Wilco Moto 500's development, uh, some top riders did help in the promotion and testing of these very rare bikes. And one such rider was X-Works Kawasaki uh, rider Lawrence Spence, who uh, will always be remembered from that epic race that he had with Graham Noyce at the 500 British Grand Prix at Farley Castle in 1983, when uh, just yards from that finish line, uh, Lawrence's gearbox seized up on his Kawasaki and he had to drag his bike over uh, the finish line. But uh, I did just manage to have a few words with Lawrence about his days uh, when he was testing this bike. And he said that uh, generally uh, for a brand new prototype British made machine, the bike uh, certainly had potential, but he said it needed a lot more uh, development. Although he did tell me that uh, the motor uh, was quite good, but uh, it didn't really have much at the bottom end. And uh, when it got past that mid-range, he says, the engine just took off like a proverbial missile. And he said you could hardly uh, hold on to the bike. But uh, he says the chassis appeared quite good in the front forks and uh, rear setup uh, certainly did their job, but they uh, also uh, needed much uh, further development but overall for a brand new British built machine he said the bike was a very good starter package but it needed to be worked on uh, to make it competitive against uh, what was already available. But when you consider that uh, this bike was all designed, built and manufactured by just one family who uh, despite their limited finances at the time it took on this massive task uh, to try and build this big 500 open class uh, motocross race bike. And for me personally, it's uh, quite amazing that they actually uh, made it all happen. Although the full uh, story of the rise and fall of these Wilkomotos is uh, a bit of a mystery really, and nobody seems to know uh, the true story behind the Wilkomoto's uh, demise. And uh, some say that uh, the actual cost of the investment in the tooling equipment to build the bikes uh, bankrupt uh, the company. And others say that uh, a fire that uh, occurred on the premises uh, wiped out uh, all of the store of bikes and their equipment and it uh, forced the company to close down. But it seems that uh, the more you investigate, the more intriguing that the Wilkomoto uh, story grows and I suppose uh, to get the definitive answer you'd have to uh, speak to a member of the Wilcox family just to get the full uh, clarification. But certainly one thing that we do know is that uh, only a very small number of these Wilco 500s were actually made and uh, I'm not even sure if many were raced on the racetrack, but uh, you just can't help being full of admiration for the Wilcox family who had the drive and the enthusiasm to take on such a massive undertaking uh, just so they could try and give Britain another fully British built 500 open class uh, motocrosser. So there you have it, your uh, final video from Classic Dirt Bike TV of 20. 22, uh, an extremely uh, rare uh, 1980 British built uh, Wilco Moto uh, 500. Now, of course, when we return in 2023, we will be uh, showcasing more of these uh, very rare bikes, and uh, we'll start off uh, next year with a look at this uh, quite nice looking 
uh, Headland uh, 500 from 1964. Now this is another a rare bike that uh, I caught a glimpse of while I was attending the uh, Drumlandrig Castle uh, weekend in July of uh, 2022. So we'll be taking a look at this uh, lovely Headland 500 when we return for our first video posting in 2023. But until then, everybody out there have the best of Christmas and uh, the very best of uh, New Year's as well. And I'll see you all again very soon when we return to Classic Dirt Bike TV in 2023.